Friday. Welcome to First Move, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee, and joining me are my co-hosts, Coindesk Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Lewitton, and Managing Director of International Content, Emily Parker. Good morning, you two. We have a date in El Salvador when Bitcoin becomes legal tender. Yeah. Very exciting stuff. All right, checking in on Bitcoin first. The Coin as Bitcoin Price XBX Index is currently trading at 33,000 and change. Bitcoin is slightly down though over the past 24 hours, about 3%. And the Coin Desk Ether Price ETX index right now is at 18.56, still below $2,000. ETH is down about 6% over the past 24 hours. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as the leader in crypto news, events, and data. So, top story. I mean, last night, El Salvador President Nayib Bukele addressed the nation, and we have an official date for when Bitcoin becomes legal tender there. It's September 7th, and the whole nation is also my, being my anniversary. $30. Your, your anniversary, come on. Yeah. Double day to, to celebrate. But every no citizen has thirty dollars worth of Bitcoin in an e wallet to spend there. Will where you go down yeah, El Salvador you need to and celebrate? Which is some weird detail. Yeah, I'm gonna talk my wife into it. I think it would be a good idea to celebrate it facial. in uh, El Salvador. Yeah, yeah, the, the facial recognition aspect of it though is kind of uh, uh, a little bit uh, let's just say uh, a little bit questionable uh there's a there is a you get that 30 dollars with with that kind of uh technology if, if you're willing to uh set up that for your uh for your wallet uh, some facial recognition technology so um yeah yeah that's uh that's some it's big government right there <laughs> yeah and like yeah, your, your thoughts yeah, I think questionable is the right word because it just raises questions. Like, I mean, this is this is uh, probably the first really big example we've seen of governments adopting Bitcoin. But yeah, it's going to come with some strings attached. Like, if you want that thirty dollars in Bitcoin, you have to go through facial recognition technology. We don't really know enough about this to to determine like how this is going to work. But yeah, it raises it raises questions for sure. Yeah. Well, our next guest has a couple of questions on El Salvador's, or a couple of opinions rather, on El Salvador's Bitcoin bill. Our next, she's a financial writer, blogger, and author of The Case for People's QE. Joining us now to discuss is Francis Coppola. Welcome, Francis, to this show. So you've argued that making Bitcoin legal tender could actually will be good for El Salvador, and they just announced the date for the law that comes to effect. Everyone gets thirty dollars in Bitcoin. Do you see this working out or do you foresee challenges ahead? I don't want to um, give the impression that this is some kind of free ride, easy ride for them. It won't be. Um, there are some potential benefits from using Bitcoin in El Salvador. Um, particularly, there's the opportunity to attract inward investment in, in Bitcoin. There's the opportunity to develop Bitcoin-based businesses. And all of that would help to develop um, El Salvador as an exporting nation and improve its GDP. And in the long run, that would be good for El Salvador. But in the shorter run, there are immense risks with this because El Salvador is a dollarized economy. It uses the dollar as its um, as its national currency, um, which is, of course, a currency it doesn't control, it doesn't print, um, and um, it has to earn or borrow that money externally. Um, and um, it, 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 this move with Bitcoin doesn't earn it any dollars. Um, it's quite low nationally on its dollar supply, um, and they were about to go. They were going into negotiations with the IMF to borrow some dollars, um, and moving to um, a partially Bitcoin-based economy where part of their reserves will be in Bitcoin and where people will be using Bitcoin actually reduces the supply of dollars in the economy. So there are huge risks. Involved. There is a real risk that they and I'm not quite sure we're going to deal with that. 
Good morning. There's also this larger tension here, kind of just about like the whole philosophy of Bitcoin. So, you know, a few of the common argue, the common criticisms that are coming up is one, this idea that Bitcoin is going to be made to a certain degree compulsory, just in the sense that merchants mm -hmm. have to accept it. Um, you know, another common criticism is that, you know, as you know, the leader of El Salvador has been criticized for showing authoritarian tendencies. And, you know, this is just kind of going to strengthen the government. And then, as we were just mentioning in the intro of the show, we don't have very much information about this, but like this idea that, you know, citizens have to go through facial recognition technology in order to access this, this $30 of Bitcoin. I, how, how concerned are you about this, this idea that, you know, Bitcoin is actually going to strengthen a government that may not have the most, I don't know, freedom embracing views at, at heart? I must admit, I am concerned about that because it seems to me that some aspects of this scheme, this, this move, um, actually do lean towards a more authoritarian agenda. Um, you've already mentioned the facial recognition technology to um, to get this this airdrop of thirty dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, but so the coming on on um, merchants to accept it now. No legal tender um, legislation in the world compels merchants to accept the currency. Legal tender has a specific meaning, which means it can be used. It must be used in settlements of debts which are disputed and have gone through the courts. It, it's never, uh, you must use this currency, but in El Salvador, it will be, you must accept this currency. And then the stop for that is this, but you can instantly then exchange it for dollars. Um, but it's relatively small. They've got available for exchanging it to dollars. They've got 150 million. How far is that going to go if every merchant in, in El Salvador opts to exchange their Bitcoin for dollars all the time? So um, I'm concerned that they may not be able to guarantee that exchange um, and that the coercive elements um, could mean that in, in a way people are forced to use a currency that they may not want to use. Francis, I, I do want to get to your discussion about tit titanium and iron in a, in a second, but I do want to ask why would El Salvador uh, compel merchants to accept Bitcoin? Is there any specific reason you think uh, El Salvador uh, that Bukele would ask uh, people to do that? Um, th there are a number of reasons why they might. I mean, the first is actually to force people to use it, to use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange rather than just receiving remittances in it and then immediately converting them into physical dollars. It's worth remembering that 70% 70, 70 of El Salvador's population currently transact exclusively in physical dollars um, no actual physical cash. And, you know, there are advantages to trying to move people off physically into a way of transacting. So, um, you know, that could be a way of, of encouraging people to use Bitcoin for transactions, to use digital transactions rather than physical cash. Um, so that might be one reason. So uh, um, getting to your discussion about uh, titanium and iron, uh, you've mm -hmm. likened it to the Weimar Republic's printing of Reichsmarks during the uh, during the reparations period when they had to make reparations with, under the Versailles Treaty. Um, we now see things like Tether, which also uh, has non it's not 100 percent backed by U.S. dollars, but by floating assets such as commercial paper, which Although people claim that they're dollar that they're as good as dollars, in fact they are market rate. If they're to believe, uh, they nonetheless are priced by the market and not one for one with the U.S. dollar. Do you see any parallel between what happened with iron and titanium uh, last week, where there was a run on the bank, and what's happening now with tether in terms of uh, it's not being backed by U.S. dollars? We had Sam Beckman freed from FTX yesterday say. He's not particularly concerned with it um, and has actually said that die is more risky than, than Tether. Do you agree with that assertion or is there something to be uh, concerned about with Tether? Um, broadly, actually, I do agree with that assertion. I think algorithmic stablecoins like DAI and certainly um, iron and titanium are hugely risky things. Um, they rely on this algorithmic stable stabilization mechanism, which works as long as everybody does what they expect them to. But if somebody then decides to 
do something else, um, like launch a speculative attack, which is what happened with Iron and Titan, Iron and Titan um, then the outcome can be very different. Now, Tether's actually got some things in place to stop that happening. So, for example, rather like a money market fund, it can delay redemptions, it can redeem in what it calls in kind, which would mean that rather than being given dollars, you would be most likely given a token, rather similar to what Bitfinex did back in 2016, where it seized a load of, you, of its customers' deposits and gave them um, Bitfinex tokens instead. Um, and all of that would tend to make it more difficult for a run on, on Tether itself to gain traction. What I think would be more likely would be um, a run on the exchanges, um, which might force them to suspend trading in Tether uh, and in pairs using Tether. That, I think, would be more likely how it would play out. Okay. All right, Francis, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. But thank you for joining us. Appreciate your insights on El Salvador as well as Tether and decentralized finance. Pleasure. That was Francis Coppola, author of The Case for People's QE. Coming up, checking in on Asia and crypto markets update with crypto wallet app, Backed. Coindesk indexes, the market standard for crypto assets since 2014. Our trusted data powers billions in publicly traded funds. Coindesk indexes are the standard used by institutions, and they're the key for investors looking to understand and access crypto markets. As the company that launched the world's first ever Bitcoin ETF, we at Purpose chose the Coindesk Bitcoin Price Index, the XBX, to price our assets. Coindesk Index has enabled the early adopters to build crypto investment vehicles, and they're already trusted by a new generation of global investors. Welcome back. Time now for the daily forecast and update on what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Here's Angie Lau of Forecast News. Welcome to the daily forecast, June 25th, 2021. I'm Justin Solomon of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain, filling in for Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Coming up, construction meets blockchain in Australia. Binance's NFT marketplace is now open for business and a look ahead at Hong Kong's digital art fair featuring NFTs. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. Blockchain for better building safety. That's what the Australian government is hoping a new partnership will do. This as authorities in Miami, Florida grapple with the partial collapse of a 12-story condo building that trapped dozens of residents. Though the cause of the tragic accident may not be known for some time, investigators will certainly be eyeing inspection records and building materials used. That process can be tedious though. Blockchain technology could speed it up and potentially prevent accidents in the future. In a partnership commissioned by the New South Wales government, Big four accounting firm KPMG, along with Australian construction company Mirvac, are developing a platform to track various elements in a building's construction process. We are combining together um, on this first incarnation of the platform uh, information around the long supply chains coming into, into our building site, like traceability of the materials. Uh, we are collecting uh, ratings from third-party independent agencies around the participants uh, who contributed to that uh, building, as well as all certificates uh, that we can collect across the supply chains. The platform also has a bit of a head start. According to Peter, it's building on existing frameworks and components from blockchain-based platforms by the company that focus on industries like agriculture and financial services. Taking a quick look at the markets now, and we start with Bitcoin, which ended the trading day here in Hong Kong up 4.3% to close at just over 34,200 by 4 p.m. local time. And in the top 10 for cryptocurrencies, it's been a mixed day of results with Dogecoin outshining the rest. It was up 13%. While the NFT market may be cooling off, interest in non-fungible tokens in the art world is still running high. Binance's NFT marketplace is officially open for business, accepting bids for its debut sale, which includes newly digitized works from legendary artist Salvador Dali and a tribute to Andy Warhol's pop art. The auction itself will run primarily on Binance's smart chain with support for the Ethereum network, allowing users to view Ethereum NFTs in Binance wallets. 
you want the chance to hang some Dolly art on your virtual wall, better get in quick. The auction closes June 29th. And finally, if you want to view those NFTs in person, a growing number of art fairs are making that possible. In New York City this week, Cube Art Fair is presenting NFTs on a 15,000 square foot billboard in famed Times Square. Well, here in Asia, Singapore's Crypto Art Week will kick off in early July, and this fall in Hong Kong, there's Digital Art Fair where NFTs will be on full display. One artist who will be showcasing his work there is Hong Kong-based Zabotage, and Forecast News Lucas Caccioli caught up with him earlier this week. So what do NFTs mean to you then? Do you think it's going to change the art world? And I think it already has at the moment, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's moving in leaps and bounds and it's a journey that we've always wanted to be part of since we've been introduced to it. Will it, will it take over art itself? I don't know. We have to watch this space and see what happens, but I think it has, it's fully loaded with opportunities and speaking uh, as an artist, I, I see the potential there of, you know, writing history. Writing or painting history one digital canvas at a time. And that's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm Justin Solomon. Until next time. The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. Here's our live look at Bitcoin. The Quintus Bitcoin Price XVX Index currently trading at 32,726. Bitcoin is slightly down about 3.5% over the past 24 hours. And the Coindesk ETH, the Price ETX Index at 1839. ETH is plummeting for the day about almost 7% according to the latest data out of Coindesk um, prices. Joining us now to discuss the crypto markets and more is Gavin Michael, CEO of BACT, a digital wallet provider. Welcome to the show, Gavin. So during El Salvador President Nayib Bukele's address, we did actually see a bounce in Bitcoin. Now it seems to be coming down slightly over the past 24 hours. So what, what's going on? So, look, we're always watching the, the Bitcoin space. And given our business model, when we see volatility, given we're a place where you can buy and sell Bitcoin, we often see strong engagement during these times. So with that being said, regardless of the price, Bitcoin has really proven that it's here to stay and will continue to be a core cryptocurrency in the market. And that's been evident, yeah. we think, for some time. And our goal is really to connect this growing digital economy from crypto to cash to rewards points to gift cards, and we're always looking to eliminate fees and importantly, provide additional liquidity to consumers through this new digital economy, through these new digital assets. So do you eventually see the price recovering back to previous uh, all time highs? You would imagine that this would be, you know, what's happening in El Salvador would be a bullish event. But I, I suppose there are several headwinds like the crackdown in China, the Fed's potentially more hawkish uh, outlook on uh, interest rates. So I think for us, when we look at it, what we're trying to do is establish a core platform that's allowing consumers to get easy access to the liquidity that they see in these digital assets. Importantly, when we think about that, and you mentioned the regulatory headwinds, we're doing it with a strong, secure backbone in the platform that we've created to allow those regulatory headwinds to almost be a competitive moat for us, to see advantage in the way in which we've engineered our platform to have those controls in its very core. But the goal of what we're doing here is really to change the game for digital wallets by bringing together all these sources of value that are mm -hmm. not captured in traditional wallets. So you, you specialize in payments. You're, you're launching a Visa debit card. What comes to mind when you see this rollout of Bitcoin payments in El Salvador? Well, I think you touched on it. This week, we launched our backed Visa debit card. And this is a fully virtual card that allows consumers to use their Bitcoin and cash balances to purchase everyday goods and services, whether that be online or in store. And I think what we're starting to do is to provide liquidity and access to these digital assets that were once hard to establish a liquidity opportunity and make it very, very easy. It means someone can see a significant gain in their Bitcoin. And instead of trying to sell and wait for a few days to transfer to a bank, 
They simply walk into their favourite store, tap their backed card, and buy that new item they've been eyeing. This Do you is have really any thoughts on, on the, how the payments are rolling out in El Salvador? Our focus right now is the US market. That's where we're uh, domiciled, that's where we're licensed, and the app that we've launched is all really focused very much on what's happening here in the US market. Our drive and our goal, as I said, is to really harness the power of this growing digital economy and really connect the asset classes in a way that's very easy for consumers to get access to liquidity. All right. Thank you very much, Gavin, for joining us. Appreciate you coming on the show and congratulations okay. on your latest launch. Great to talk to you. Thanks very much for the time. All right. That was back CEO Gavin Michael coming up, checking in on our next guest, which is the mayor of Miami. Check out what he has to say about El Salvador and more. Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. Earlier, we spoke to the mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez, who wants to make his city the crypto capital of the world. He's made inroads with crypto exchanges to open offices in Miami, encourages clean energy Bitcoin miners to move in their data centers, and suggests city staff have the option to be paid in Bitcoin. He also wears the Bitcoin laser eyes on social media. I asked Mayor Suarez what incentives he's offering to crypto firms to make a move to Miami more enticing. I think there's a lot of enticing about Miami, beginning with the fact that we were first movers uh, in the crypto space. We were the first city to put uh, Satoshi's white paper on our website. Uh, we were the first city uh, to begin uh, offering our employees the ability to pay in crypto, our, our residents the ability to pay fees and taxes in crypto, and potentially eventually hold crypto in our balance sheet. So we've been probably the most forward-thinking city in America on crypto, maybe one of the most forward thinking in the country and the world. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, is very attractive to people in, in the crypto and the Bitcoin space. In particular. Are you offering any direct incentives to businesses? We have an incentive packages for all businesses that are moving to the city. If you locate in the downtown development authority, that's one. I think the second thing is we have nuclear power, which is cheap and is abundant. Uh, and it's something that is not, uh, and it's clean. It's not something that's available in all parts of the country or the world. And I think it can help tremendously with the ESG issues that uh, Bitcoin mining is, is facing and doing. Hey, as far as uh, I've spoken to a lot of VCs uh, in, in the Miami area and, and people who are involved in tech, and they see four problems that Miami has in attracting uh, technology such as Bitcoin developers and, and the like. First of all, there, there's no major anchor such as a Google or Facebook or Microsoft that some of the other cities in this country have. There's no, uh, there's no world-class engineering school like Caltech, MIT, um, Cooper Union or, or, uh, or, or the likes. There's a tremendous amount of traffic 
uh, getting around the city of Miami. You, you, you know, uh, uh, those of us who have been stuck on 95, um, you know, feel pain every day when we, when we take it. And finally, uh, th- there's also the housing stock, a lot of new housing stock in the, in the upper end. But for things in the middle, for the kind of uh, housing stocks that would be necessary to attract uh, younger talent who maybe might not have the resources but are trying to work their way as they as they create these new companies, it's just not there. It seems to be quite bifurcated. So housing, real estate, uh, and uh, anchors such as uh, companies and, and institutional, what are you guys doing to deal with these headwinds and to address them? Well, I, I was kind of laughing as you were saying it because those are sort of the counter brands on Miami. But, you know, there, there is a, a city in urban America that doesn't have traffic issues. Uh, if, if you want to hear what Los Angeles traffic issues are, or New York's traffic issues are, uh, you know, you can ask their residents and they'll tell you that they have a major traffic issues. We're actually one of the few cities that's actually doing something about it, which is why we've been uh, meeting with the Boring Company, which is Elon Musk's underground tunneling company to actually have, uh, you know, uh, have urban uh, underground. Around as it, uh, in terms of our university system, it's funny that you say that because today FIU, which is my alma mater, just got ranked the number one a public uh, institution in the state of Florida, and so it's something I put out on my social media. So maybe we haven't done such a good job talking about how great our university system is down here and how much talent we produce and export and have exported for multiple decades. But I think that anybody who has been paying attention to Miami after December fourth can tell you without reservation. Uh, we attracted from Los Angeles the largest Bitcoin conference in the world. Uh, we got FTX to name the arena, which was a $200 million naming rights, a large crypto trader. Uh, we have eToro, which is the second largest uh, crypto trading platform in the world, named uh, Miami, one of its uh, headquarters, its domestic headquarters, its American headquarters. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, uh, I'm sorry, blockchain.com also named uh, Miami its headquarters. So we have all the momentum in the world. Um, we have, you know, in terms of having major uh, companies, all the companies that you mentioned have a presence in Miami. Google, Microsoft have offices in Miami. They may not be headquartered in Miami, but they all have offices in Miami. And frankly, if you if you talk to the, their their CEOs and their upper echelon uh, employees, which I have, they're expanding their presence in Miami significantly uh, because they see that this moment is converting into a movement where uh, you know cities like Miami are, are becoming the capital of capital because we have a favorable tax structure. And um, we have a tremendous quality of life that is significantly better than the some of the cities that you mentioned. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is that a lot of uh, cities that are in uh, particularly developed time from the, in the university perspective may not necessarily be tech hubs per se. They export a lot of their time as well. Show um, you you raised an excellent point, which is that Miami probably does have a first mover advantage, and it does have a lot of momentum. But that could change, right? Maybe largely in part thanks to your efforts. We're going to see a lot of cities across the United States trying to become the center of cryptocurrency. And in fact, as you know, there's a mayoral race happening in New York right now, and the front runner uh, Eric Adams has said that he wants New York City to become the center of Bitcoin. So let's just, you know let's just get into it. Like, who's going to be the center of Bitcoin, Miami or New York? Well, look, I think, first of all, it's great that the, the, you know, potential mayor of New York is saying that. Listen, I want every city in urban America to succeed. And I think for every city to succeed, not just in urban America, but across the world, we've got to start uh, adopting Bitcoin. We have to start uh, mainstreaming Bitcoin more and more into our everyday life uh, for a variety of reasons that we can get into. But I think, uh, you know, I think it's interesting because, uh, you know, I didn't hear, uh, you know, the candidate, uh, mayor-elect p- potentially, uh, talk much about it during his campaign. Uh, and I, I don't know what he's going to be able to do about the tax differential and the cost of living differential between New York and Miami, which is, I think, also pushing a tremendous amount of people to Miami. So if he's willing to pledge that he's going to reduce uh, the city's income tax to zero, uh, maybe even urge the county to, I mean, sorry, the, the state to reduce their state income tax to zero, which they pay, uh, their budget is double the size of the state of Florida. The state of Florida has a greater population than the state of New York. So, uh, you know, I think I think they have some other fundamental problems that make it very, very difficult for that to, to become a reality. Mayor Suarez, you touched Mayor. on this earlier about the ESG concerns. And right now, China is cracking down on miners uh, ostensibly because of part of these ESG concerns. So are you trying to attract these Chinese Bitcoin miners? And uh, what are your thoughts on that? First of all, I'm not so sure that the reason why China is cracking down on them is for ESG concerns. That's I mean, what they, they have, say, at least. They, that's what they say, yeah. They, they, you know, they, they've been, uh, you know, part of the reason why there's ESG concerns 
uh, related to mining is because there's so much coal producing uh, mining happening in China. Uh, I, I think China just just issued its own uh, cryptocurrency. And I think China, which is a command economy that wants to control every aspect of society, probably doesn't like the fact that Bitcoin is decentralized, is not controlled by a central bank, and they, that they don't assume uh, their ability to control their currency is going to be in jeopardy. And that's probably why they're, they're kicking out crypto miners and less about ESG concerns. And there is this uh, migration, though, to the West. Are you uh, incentivized or are trying to attract these miners to come to Miami? We do want Miami to be a mining hub. We think that uh, we offer uh, relatively inexpensive energy costs. We think that technology um, obviates the differential in terms of temperature because some people say, you know, Miami's hotter and so uh, it's, it's harder to keep the computers cooled. Uh, and I think there's new technology that's going to make it easier. There's new microchips that are coming out that are half, that, you know, require half the energy use than the microchips that are being used now to mine. Uh, and then, of course, you have things like proof of stake versus proof of, proof of concept uh, that may uh, reduce the need for as, as many mathematical computations as are happening currently on the Bitcoin system. So there are a lot of different uh, ways that I think uh, the crypto Bitcoin world deal with the ESG issue. But I think you also have to put the ESG issue in context. And people make a big deal of the fact that, uh, you know, that Bitcoin mining uh, takes up the same amount of electricity of Argentina. First of all, I'm not so sure that's ever been confirmed, but let's assume for argument's sake that it's true, right? Bitcoin has uh, at least had <laughs> a trillion dollar uh, plus value. Um, it may be less than now after, after its recent price drops. But the GDP of Argentina is 500 million. Uh, sorry, sorry, 500 billion. So you have uh, a technology that has double the value uh, that is actually twice as efficient as all the energy use of a particular country. And if that's going to be the basis currency of the world, it's definitely going to require a lot of, a lot of energy. It's going to require a lot more energy than just one country worth. Mayor Suarez, uh, Miami, we're, we're in the northernmost city in Latin America, basically. Um, you've attracted, the city has attracted a lot of banking from Latin America as well. And now you're focusing on Bitcoin and crypto. Do you see that as a change in focus or do you see any synergies happening? Are you working on it, on creating synergies between Latin American banks that are located in uh, Miami or, or do you think that it's just going to be too, too many different things to handle and maybe you should just focus on crypto for now? No, tremendous synergies. And I think that uh, the Latin American, uh, South American market uh, could end up being, and, and it seems to be right now, the market that is adopting uh, Bitcoin and crypto in particular at uh, the highest rate, the fastest rate. So obviously we all know what's happening in El Salvador. Uh, I've, been, I've been hearing Panama doing similar things. And when you consider the fact that a lot of these countries for years have dealt with currency manipulation, uh, tremendous amounts of corruption, the fact that they can potentially be on a currency system that is significantly greater in value, no matter what the you know fluctuations and the volatility, than the U.S. dollar is right now, and that's indisputable. You know, one uh, one Bitcoin is worth thirty something thousand U.S. dollars, uh, and the fact that it can't be manipulated through a monetary policy or fiscal policy by any country um, is something that's very powerful as a, a, a you know a purchasing power tool for these countries, and I think they're strongly considering it. And I think if, if you start to see adoption there, you may see some adoption in Africa, and that may create a worldwide uh, adoption of, of unregulated cryptocurrencies. What about the volatility? Speaking, you about, speaking to about Salvador, uh, speaking about Salvador, since you just mentioned it, um, I know that that El Salvador has announced that they are going to accept Bitcoin as legal tender, something that was actually first announced in Miami. Um, but since then, there's been some criticism and some backlash. And one of the popular criticisms is that this is not in the spirit of Bitcoin because it's basically saying that merchants have to accept Bitcoin if it is offered to them. And that's this sort of making Bitcoin compulsory. Um, I'm just curious how you respond to that. Look, I think anytime you do anything in public life, there's somebody that has the criticism for it. You know, it, it, it reminds you of, uh, I was talking to the editorial board and they're, you know, uh, being critical of the fact that we have income inequality in our cities, which we do, and every, every city in urban America has it. And then as you're bringing high paying jobs, you say, well, those high paying jobs are creating gentrification. So, well, how else do you, you cure income inequality and poverty unless you create high paying jobs? So it's sort of a circular problem where anytime somebody creates a solution, somebody identifies a problem to create a solution. So I think, I think, you know, People should have the right to be able to use uh, a, a Bitcoin in, uh, you know, in um, in any sort of establishment. The fact that a government could mandate it, uh, you know, again, most people always criticize Bitcoin because it wasn't mainstream. 
now that it's becoming mainstream, people are criticizing the fact that it's mainstream. And I think that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of short sighted. I think you have to focus on the yeah. utility of Bitcoin and the reason why it exists. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the fact that it's completely uh, untethered and, and for the, for the, for the moment, it's been unhackable. Mayor, you alluded to this earlier, you know, the market cap of Bitcoin used to be over a trillion dollars. Now it's almost half that. Are you concerned about the volatility when you're giving it into the hands of a normal everyday people who don't want to see if they're making a salary that see that cut in half a, a couple months down the line? Uh, again, that, that that view is is kind of a tricky view. What you're doing is you're analyzing the last few months of Bitcoin. If you look at Bitcoin year over year, there's still a significant increase, right? And so I think that's one issue. The second issue is what, what do you think Bitcoin is going to become? Is it always going to become a store of value or is it going to metamorphosize at some point into a currency or something that's used as an everyday thing uh, to buy and sell goods? I think, you know, in terms of the evolution or mainstreaming of Bitcoin, we're still probably in the third or fourth inning of a nine inning game. And certainly, you know, part of, of, of giving people these the, the freedom to choose whether or not they want to be paid in Bitcoin, which, by the way, they could do on their own. They could just get paid in dollars, turn around, open up a, a Coinbase account or a, a Gemini account or a, a Blockchain.com account uh, and, 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 and buy their own Bitcoin. Um, so you're just making it easier and, and, and creating something that is not otherwise available to any other employee. And by the way, it's, it's available to high end, wealthy uh, employees like football players and basketball players and, and, and professional athletes. Mary Suarez, uh, a few miles north of us on A1A, uh, there's a, uh, a, a fellow uh, Floridian Republican in Mar-a-Lago who is not a big fan of, of Bitcoin um, and what it means for the dollar. Uh, he, he sees it as a challenge to the supremacy of the U.S. dollar. What do you say to him? It is definitely a challenge to the supremacy of the U.S. dollar. And I think most people that are in his age bracket uh, similarly have uh, fears or skepticisms over Bitcoin. I mean, that's that's what I've encountered in terms of talking to people that are, um, you know, that are in that age demographic. Uh, I, I, what I would say uh, to those guys, you know, what, what is, what is the U.S. government doing to impact the U.S. dollar? Well, it's, it's, it's not balancing its budget. It's spending money uh, frivolously and, and, and in enormous amounts, which can create hyperinflation. And so, uh, of course, I mean, uh, you know, of course it's going to threaten the U.S. dollar. It already is threatening the U.S. Dollar. One, uh, you know, U.S. dollar, a Bitcoin used to be a fraction of a U.S. dollar. And if, and if the currency of the world, the U.S. dollar, was supreme, you know, a, a, a currency that is that is that was created by mutual consent, essentially, should never be worth more than a currency backed by a government that is, you know, doing things the right way. So I think all I mean is that these governments have, you know, riled up massive deficits, are not fiscally disciplined, and then they say, oh, there's co competition, which we're supposed to. We're supposed to love in this country competition. A competitive product um, is, is the product that people are choosing over a product that we have the ability to manipulate and, and, and oftentimes do not manipulate to the benefit of the people. I mean, I, I just don't understand the argument. Man, you look concerned at all about a U.S. government crackdown on Bitcoin, either because it is challenging the dollar or because, you know, we're starting to hear crypto mentioned a lot in the same sentence as ransomware. Is it that something that's very hard to control at a city level? Is that something that you're concerned about? You know, I think there's going to be some regulation at some point. Uh, I think it'll be more similar to like financial products in terms of the way financial products are regulated. But I don't think that there can be regulation that does what China did. You know, you don't have in the United States, you don't have the kind of authoritarian control that you have in China. So you can't just shut something down. Um, you know, I remember when when uh, Uber started uh, sort of uh, operating outside of the rules here in Miami-Dade County, and there literally was not enough code enforcement officers to cite every single Uber driver because we went from 2,500 taxis to 14,000 Uber drivers almost overnight. Um, so there are things that happen in our in our community that are too big to regulate. I think Bitcoin is one of them. We have, you know, over 100 million, uh, you know, Bitcoin accounts uh, in, in, the, in the world, uh, potentially, you know, tens of millions in the United States. And I just don't think the federal government is going to be able to go computer by computer and try to shut people down. I mean, when my mother and my aunt are asking me how to set up a Coinbase account, uh, I think the, the being able to shut it down has, has ended. Mayor Suarez, are there any uh, currencies that worry you, the likes of Monero? Are, are there any that you think uh, you'd rather not see being used in Miami or, or in general? Look, I think, you know, in this world of uncertainty, there's a lot of things that worry, right? There are things that 
I have to, as an investor and as someone who, um, you know, is putting your hard earned money into this, you have to do a deep dive into the utility and sort of the back end and the mathematics uh, and, and, and the case studies and the use studies for anything that you get involved in, right? And I think that there's, there's, there's a lot of unknowns and, and, and fuzzy things that are happening in the crypto world. But I also think what Bitcoin has done is it's established itself. It's established its value. It's established its utility. It's established its transferability. It's, it's established the fact that it's hard to hack, uh, if not impossible to hack, and that it's secure, uh, and that it's, and it's not tethered, right? And so even though, yes, the, the volume, you know, the transaction volume is part needs to be to avoid some level of volatility. I think that will come in the future. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I'm very bullish on it, of course. All right, that was Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. Time now to check in with Crypto Twitter with our tweet of the day. This one coming from El Salvador President Nayib Bukele tweeting after addressing the nation, promise kept, made in 2017, retweeting an old message saying, well, yes, it is official. We will use Bitcoin. The world is watching, President Bukele. That's it for First Mover. Thank you, Emily Parker and Lawrence Lewitton. I'm your host, Christine Lee. I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with all about Bitcoin. Coming up at noon is The Hash. You're watching Coindesk TV.